I'm going to start without any preliminaries, only wish uh, Usha uh, a good afternoon from here. And I hope she uh, monitors me, not for time, but for what I say. Uh, she's just sent me the link to a document which the Planning Commission that was and the Niti Ayog that is, has brought out. And I'm going to read out two or three sections which are of critical importance to us. And then I'll start saying what I want to say. This, uh, the, the, it's the 16.28 of the document says that... Um, Second, adoption of technology, especially digital platforms, would lead to disintermediation between the government and its citizens. I don't know what disintermediation means. Uh, between government and its citizens and push government services on a neutral and transparent platform. This has the potential to transform government administration systems and substantially reduce the scope for exercise of discretion by government officers. Quite the contrary. While technology can be used for various government activities, one such example is the promotion of government e-market, which is aimed at replacing the current procurement system with a digital marketplace. Complete disaster, complete corruption. From my, These are footnotes of mine. <laughs> this will help in bringing transparency and reducing scope for corruption in procurement systems in India. 16.29 says, other technology-led solutions which encourage government interaction with citizens and businesses in a presenceless and paperless manner, presenceless, paperless, presenceless manner, should be introduced wherever possible. Such systems both reduce the avenues of corruption available to officers and also make it possible to focus vigilance on those transactions which do not take place through them. When I was leaving, when I went to India for a week in between my teaching assignment here, and I happened to uh, hear, and it was later confirmed, the same Niti Aayog has said that it will not be necessary for government to run where institutions and systems and services can be privatized, they must be privatized. But everything can be privatized. What, what prevents a government from privatizing the, the, the job of a prime minister? You can privatize anything. If you're going to privatize all essential services, all obligations to the citizens of the country, why don't you sell the prime minister's job, the, the, the chief secretary's job, the cabinet secretary's job? Everything can be auctioned off to the highest bidder. I don't see any sense in what's happening in my country. And I just wanted to share this with you before I began what I wanted to say, because Usha was keen that I share this with you. I'm going to begin with... Do you want that Niti Ayog Well, I think it'll I'll probably at the end, because now I, I let me continue, because I have maybe already exhausted two minutes of my time. So I'm going to just fill in the cracks, because a lot of things have been said. But basically what I'm going to say is that, basically my statement is that in this chaos of fighting these polarized battles that have been artificially created, where dichotomies are created where they don't exist, and polarization is the norm of the day. If you're not polarized, then no debate is possible, no discussion is possible in my country. So if you say this, this, this technology is harmful, you're made into an anti-technology Luddite. What, Luddite? Yes. So you're called a Luddite. If you say this technology will lead to concentration of power, you're a Luddite. If you say, and then you're defending yourself all the time saying, I'm not a Luddite. This is not what I meant. Actually, technology delivers. All I'm saying is, so the, the argument of power, the, use, the tools of power has changed today. And actually, let's understand it. It's not a discussion on technology. It's a discussion of power. What we are really talking about is who controls and who controls absolutely. And this goes against the entire tide of the last two decades when people have fought serious battles to say that you cannot con centralize power, that you cannot concentrate power. Power must be unpacked. You have to decentralize power. 
power according to democracy has to be decentralized, whether you call it by participation or some other name, decentralization of power and the sovereignty of the people which is enshrined in every single constitution and statement made in every country should become a reality. We were all told information is power. We are being sick to death to hear of this. Everybody says information is power. We have been told power controls and absolute power controls absolutely. What my government and every other government is doing today, speaking the language of decentralization and actually amassing power to itself. And I do not think technology is neutral. Technology is there like you have water. You can contaminate the water, you can use the water, but it is a, it's a facility, it is a utility. It lends itself to whatever biases the user has. So ultimately when technology is used, it is biased. It can never be a non-biased technology. Uh, everything has a bias. You replace something and therefore you have a value base. You also say that something is better than the other. So while we fought for decentralization and every single government felt the sting of having to share power, this technology has lent it a huge tool for bringing back centralization with the jargon and uh, stated ideology of decentralization and power sharing, but actually controlling everything. When I was an undergraduate student in Delhi University, I read a book called How to Lie with Statistics. It was a Penguin publication. Maybe you remember that, Suzanne. And that was a very, it made a very serious impact on me. And it was an English professor of statistics who argued that statistics are not neutral. He argued that you can get whatever statistics you want depending on what you wanted to prove. When I became a civil servant and went to the same institute with Vajahat to train, we were told that as government servants, you can go, do good or you can do harm. You can get rules to support you if you do good. You can get rules to support you if you want to do harm. A judicious officer will always want to do good, therefore will invoke the right rules. This is what we were both told. So neutrality of technology, I dismiss absolutely. We've also got another kind of a debate going today, which is very, very, I think, very, uh, very harmful to us, <clears throat> which is we wanted a kind of real privacy protected. This entire establishment turns everything inside out. So if I want real privacy, the government of India is actually hacking at all the websites through which poor persons access information to claim them. So the MIS on the works program, which told you exactly how much money had been given to people through which Soumya found out that eight weeks had been paid on paper and actually you got only three weeks. Everything is being rapidly removed, saying that they are listening to our call on privacy and they don't want to make public the money is that they have paid a worker or a laborer. And we are all very, very scared because in this debate on the internet amongst all of us who are campaigners, there are many friends of mine who have been writing repeatedly saying negative impacts of some of the things we are saying are already beginning. So they call, they take every single statement you make and they turn it inside out. There is no such thing and some of my colleagues in the larger universe say, that we are talking of the era which is post-truth and post-ideology. And that's why you want neutrality and you want technology. Truth is not an ideology. Truth is a principle. Truth lays the basis of a democracy which will honor its commitments from the time before Christ, from the time of the Buddha and before. We've been talking about truth. It still is an important thing. And of course, Bacon said that uh, Pontius Pilate asked Christ what is truth and didn't wait for an answer. So we have not waited for an answer, but we are still groping for truth. Gandhi wrote his book called Experiments with Truth. Truth and truth in the public domain is a dominant concern of all of us who fight injustice, who fight inequality and want some kind of rationality to prevail in public life. So when we call a, a, a whole era post-truth and even post-ideology, we are really walking into the mire. Because even saying that you don't have an ideology is an ideology. Even a person who says he's an atheist has a faith. 
that there is no God. So how can we say it's the post-truth generation? I simply can't understand. All these things have been taken together and meshed and plated into this bogey of a technology that will resolve all our problems, that it's neutral, that it's post-truth, it's post-ideology, it's just, it's God. As you said, as when you began this workshop this morning, it's God. So what do you do? You reduce every single thought to a mockery of itself. And technology helps you do it. Because it's invisible most of the time. You don't know what happens behind it. There is no statement. It's just figures. It's just charts. It's huge amounts of massed information which ordinary people can't read. So till we get ourselves literate, which will be another 60 years ahead, to read all those charts and papers, we will have lost most of what we have built up maybe in the last many millennia. So what are we going to do about it is a question I want to ask you. And in this process, in my country, and I'm sure in other countries, you invert political thoughts. While you're doing this to, to development thoughts, to democratic thoughts, you're also do, doing it to individuals. You reduce everybody to a symbol. So no real debate of thought, of philosophy, of political doctrine ever rests with us. Because Gandhi then just becomes a pair of spectacles, or the, or the broom, or a cow. What he really said about tolerance, what he said about fear, how about what he said about facing fear, all get washed away. And all we think of Gandhi is that he's a cow, or he's a pair of glasses, or that he is something very insignificant, like a broom. He talked about cleansing, not only of public toilets. He talked about cleansing of the moral fabric of my country. But he's been reduced to a man who only thought of cleaning the floor. So I, I'm afraid of the kind of statistics that helps build up these images, build up all this false dichotomy and these false politics, political doctrine, to really dismantle the basis of ethics and accountability in public life. So you now say, oh, we are a paperless office. Ever since the right to information came to be, every government has sought ways and means of not producing records. Ivan, Bajahat, Nikhil, Shankar, Saumya will all bear me out. Because the moment you reduce your record system to nothing but things you keep on the internet alone, you can always fudge it. We have now got extraordinary debates going on in India about the electronic voting machine and how it can be manipulated and how elections can be fudged and you can really get people to vote, to vote according to your choice by just changing a couple of things inside the machine. No matter what button you press, it will only vote for the candidate it's already pre-chosen. So all these technological vampires are sitting all around us. So at that point of time to say it's God is unacceptable. Technology is important, but technology is a very good servant but a lousy master. It's a good technology if I can use my phone, if I can use the internet, if I can use it to type and retain stuff, I can use this, you can use that. I can look at uh, information on it, I can find out from Google about something I don't know. Yes, it is very good. The biggest victim of all this is rationality. The moment we use, lose rationality, we've lost it. In my country, talking about technology on the one side, we are removing from our textbooks all the basis of science. We are saying that India did the first plastic surgery when in one of our myths we had a god with an elephant head, that that was the first plastic surgery. It's a myth. Now who's going to believe that? So in every which way, you're attacking science, which is the basis of technology. You're attacking scientific thought, which is the basis of modern thought. But you're saying technology is useful because technology, as I said, is a very good servant and they are using it to propagate their ideology their, their ambitions and trying to destroy democracy. Once I was asked to talk in, uh, in Berkeley and I talked about democracy versus capitalism and they were very upset with me. But now we all know that it could be that. So it's democracy is democracy uses, uh, it's a loose word, you can use it for anything you like. I can use it with one meaning, you can use it with the other and we can all stand together and shout for democracy. The moment we say now let's plan we have 20 agendas. And what today's democratic majoritarianism is, is different from what you and I have in mind when we cast that vote. 
So all the words that you see come out of irrationality. Magic bullet. Who wants a magic bullet? I want a reasoned argument. Then they say magic wand. Okay, bullet is very, you know, potentially violent. So let's call it a magic wand. They call it, then they have these icons, these strong men, whether it's Trump or whether it's Modi or whether it's somebody else who will resolve all problems, who is in fact an incarnation of God. Because who else can resolve all problems? So you have this idea of a strong leader who is led completely behind the scenes by big money and by ideas which are completely manipulated by religious minorities or religious majorities or by bigots or whoever. It's a whole gamut of people who are invisible and behind this leader. So in my opinion, technology has really enabled the selling, as I said last evening, of the single narrative that is convenient to the rulers of my country and of every other country. You cannot, you cannot challenge that one narrative because they bring in so many facts and figures that in my village when I sit and say, look, this is not true, they'll say, but it's the newspaper says so, the television says so. So I have to spend seven hours arguing with a one-line statement on the television or in the newspaper saying that is not true because these are the facts of the case. So on the one hand, you built up a whole agenda of people to get literate, to read newspapers, to understand news, to listen to world news, and you're feeding them with this single narrative, whatever the narrative may be, which alone is the truth, but nothing else is. So for me, technology, not only this technology of storing data, but the use of this data and what it does is extremely harmful. I do not think that digitalization is a bad idea. I'm not, I don't have a quarrel with Swami. But the point is, you can't just end there. It has to come out and be completely open. We say, you collect all the information, place everything in the public domain. Let's all access it. You know that we have filed so many RTIs and we have not been able to access any information that's so far been digitalized in very special areas. We couldn't get an answer from the Reserve Bank of India as to why they demonetized. What were the reasons for demonetizing? They just rejected our right to information. Or how much has come back? Or how much money has actually come back to the coffers? <laughs> they said that it was an anti-corruption, an anti-terrorist move. So what has come back? But the biggest bogey of, for persons like me, and I'm sure there are many in my generation who saw India being divided and who saw the bloodshed of two countries created on, of, out of a bloodbath, that religious animosity and hatred can be the end of everything. India is the second largest Muslim nation in the world after Indonesia. We have the largest Muslim population after Indonesia. And you, in, in, we in India are really doing what I thought would never happen after the partition and after the assassination of Gandhi. We are now victimizing, and I am very grateful to Swami for having said that story, so that I don't have to bring stories to you, that we are victimizing a particular community, victimizing them on the basis of hate, hate speeches, and all kinds of distorted information propagated by and substantiated by wrong data. Data collected and propagated in absolutely the wrong way. So for me, data is very suspicious. You feed all these things into people. I remember once entering into a heated debate with educated people. In India, we differentiate between literacy and education. We say there are many people who are literate but uneducated, and there are many people who are educated but illiterate. Because education is a much wider thing than literacy. And I've seen literate people argue with me many years ago, about 15 years ago, that the size of India's population, you asked anybody, because it's great bogey of India being taken over by the Muslims. Muslims are Indians. We've grown up with them. They are brothers, sisters. We sing the same songs. We eat the same food. We are one community. Maybe they converted to a different religion, and why not? I won't go into the problems with Hinduism. But anyway, now today they say to us, when I ask somebody, how many, are Hind how many Muslims in India? They said 25%. Actually, it is only 16%. Now, it was 11% then. So even with facts and figures, the way we project these ideas into the public domain, who talks what, where, is a, for me a very, very frightening aspect. And of course today, we have bigoted fundamentalist chief ministers 
and we have political parties which talk about nothing but hate. If this kind of information of tracking us comes into their hands, because now there is a profile on me, there is what Nikhil called today in the morning the collation of all of this data into one button, one fingerprint, one pressing of the button, one name, and you get every single thing. I am profiled. I am profiled politically. I am profiled in every possible way. And I am also profiled in my demography. So you can see my face. You can know what I think. You know what I am. You know which banks I am operating, which books I am reading. And it's really frightening because this is going to lead, if ever India gets worse than it is today, to a hounding of communities based <coughs> simply on religion or on caste or on any one of the indicators that they will then use to, uh, to uh, really break us up. I wanted this up, and so did Usha. So we put this up here. So this is how I think we use it politically. If Julian Assange says, I give private information on corporations and government to you for free, we call him a criminal. If Mark Zuckerberg says, I give you private information to corporations, I give your private information to corporations and government for money, the media calls him the man of the year. So as I argued, information or data is never neutral. You have to take a political position. And I'm sure many of you have seen the film called The uh, Internet Boy. No, yeah. is it Internet Boy, where this young man accesses Internet Boy. He accesses information and shares it with the whole world from the Harvard Library. And he Aaron had four. Schwartz. Yeah. Sorry? Aaron Schwartz. Uh, yes, Aaron Schwartz. And then he was hounded to such an extent that he committed suicide. And his information has enabled research on cancer, has enabled research on so many vital issues because it's disseminated information far beyond the elite and the people who have total control on academic knowledge. So I think that anywhere that I see controls being vested in one place, controls being vested in one authority, Controls being vested in a non-consultative process where parliament is completely relegated to the sidelines, where any kind of political discussion is relegated to the sidelines. Politics is now losing. We really have a situation today where the loss is politics. And you cannot lose politics without losing democracy. So what we are really talking of is the hollowing out of democratic, the notion of democracy, the process of democracy, and relationships of democracy. My one minute has long been shown. I think maybe I've taken two. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to say something before I begin, uh, re um, reflecting on what Aruna said about Aaron Schwartz and the, and the film about his fate. Um, in the Open Society Archives, which is a, an organizational unit, a part of CEU, and it's very close physically, uh, we have uh, we established last year an Aaron Schwartz Fellowship, and the first fellow is working right now and in OSA, so working on <coughs> on uh, opening data and distributing it uh, within the large public. But that was just a, a small remark. What I would like to contribute to this discussion is some lessons from former new democracies, and maybe that's the yes. What is former new democracy? If, uh, if a country or a society was a democracy or a new democracy, it doesn't mean that now it's an old democracy or an established democracy. Certainly it's not the case with this country where I grew up uh, in a non-democracy, then I lived in a democracy, let's say, and now I'm living in, a, in something uh, what the, the present political regime uh, proudly announced as an illiberal democracy. But still, formally, it's a democracy. And if we talk about democracies, and I'm, um, again, reflecting what, what, what uh, Aruna uh, said, that uh, it's not only democracy in the formal sense of the word. We are talking about sister concepts or related concepts, of course, rule of law, constitutionality, and all other things. But now, for the sake of sim simplicity, I will, I will stick to democracy. So it's a learning process, we all know. 
But how long does it take? Hungary, is it a former new democracy? I would say yes. Some uh, critical um, voices say that Hungary is a former democracy, but I wouldn't go that far. It's a former new democracy. But can we regard Spain or Portugal or Greece or even Germany as a former new democracy? Uh, the, the unification of East and West Germany, think of this. The only thing what is important is that for a new democracy, you need fundamental change of the political system in a relatively short time, with or without bloodshed, if I may say. The more important thing is for us that these new democracies uh, have to import new rights and institutions instead of uh, developing them in an organic way without experience. That happened everywhere. I will concentrate on the former new democracies. It's, it's easier to define this group of countries in this region, the former Soviet bloc, including Hungary and, and others, because uh, it's, uh, it's evident that, uh, that they were, uh, at time, new democracies. The social and cultural traditions in these countries are not exactly the same as our expectations were at that time. I'm, I'm talking in, in past tense. And there's a big difference between law and reality. Why is it important? Why are these lessons important and for whom? I'm absolutely convinced that these lessons, including some good developments and some grave mistakes, we did, I may say, uh, for countries other than future new democracies or future democracies or present new democracies. Uh, India, for example, is an established uh, democracy with, uh, with, <coughs> with many, uh, uh, many problems, but we all have many problems. So even for India, I think, despite cultural and, and administrative and all other differences, legal differences, I think these lessons uh, could be useful in some way or another. And mostly because the role of informational rights we are talking about, the right to public information and all its relatives, like, uh, like freedom of information, access to public information, right to information, even freedom of expression, because freedom of expression without having access to information, it's like, uh, maybe you remember this expression, the Russian period uh, was called uh, glasnost, that was before the, the perestroika, glasnost, openness, that was a period of freedom without information. So you could openly criticize everybody and everything without knowing exactly what was going on. <laughs> so um, there's a typical dynamics here, and the other side is, of course, privacy. And I'm very glad that it's now almost trivial that the two sister rights are not against each other. They are sister rights, really. Both are in the interest of the weaker party and, again, against the, the stronger party, the state, the companies, and so on. So the dynamics. There has always been an initial euphoria in this country and all other late comers or early uh, um, experimenting countries, followed quite soon by a disillusionment. So in the first few years, all kinds of informational rights, constitutionality, privacy, access to information, had very high value in society because they wanted to, to learn the <coughs> secret information which, uh, which were hidden from them for decades by the, by the in that, that case, communist government. And also they wanted to learn the, uh, the, f the content of the files, the, the secret agents collected about them. But it disappeared almost completely because new values emerged and the new generation grew up very quickly and money, uh, power and all other kinds of values became more, <coughs> more um, valuable, more important for them than these ones. Informal dictatorship, but it's not only uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Greece, for example, uh, they remained uh, sensitive to political surveillance, but absolutely indifferent to business, or well, let's say neutral administrative surveillance. Uh, there's, a, there's a name uh, uh, coined by, uh, by, just can't recall his name, um, Minas Samatas, uh, who, is a, who is a Greek scholar, and he coined this, the Greek surveillance paradox, roughly about this, but we, we can talk about the Hungarian, 
the, the post-Soviet uh, surveillance paradox. And some scholars like uh, Maria Loss um, said that um, these countries simply skipped democratic modernity and jumped directly into the surveillance, uh, surveillance culture of postmodernity. And those people who were interested in, uh, in building up a surveillance society, so to say, they were very successful in uh, converting the fear of the regime, the, the previous regime, the dicta uh, dictatorial regime, to the fear of crime. And that legitimated the, uh, the introducing and building up of new and new uh, 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 surveillance uh, uh, silos or data silos. There are of course cultural differences within this region and maybe between the cultural west and cultural east and it seems that on the surface in the eastern cultural, cultural hemisphere people are less sensitive to certain things like numbering people uh, which uh, in, in the West, especially after the Second World War and the Holocaust, uh, it's, it's something very sensitive, at least for a, for a generation. But it's not true that they are not sensitive. Uh, the borderlines are somewhere, uh, somewhere else than maybe in, uh, in the West. So um, what is the role of NGOs in such former um, uh, new uh, uh, democracies? Uh, these NGOs originally were formed to protect or to fight for one of the two uh, families of informational rights. Uh, either for people's privacy and have access to, to their secret service files or for access to government or public information. And after a certain period they gradually developed a sense for the other right, for the other side. And I think uh, although I, I'm talking about this region, but that's exactly the, the case, if I'm not wrong, please correct me if, I, if, if I'm wrong, that MKSS did the same. MKSS uh, concentrated on access to public information, but now MKSS enlarged its, its scope and included what you were talking and you are all talking about. AIP, it's a Bulgarian uh, uh, access, to, access to information program, EPIC, uh, is, is not from the region, it's Electronic Privacy Information Center. That, that's the core of, uh, of their, their, their business, but they are, they are dealing with questions of access to information. So gradually NGOs uh, um, see that, that uh, the rights are sister rights and the technologies. Code is law, that's from Lawrence uh, Lessig. And I'm not talking about new technologies. New technologies are here, on your table, in your pocket, already installed and, and used in, in, uh, in, in the biggest biometric uh, ex experiment or even more in India. So new technology is here. What I'm talking is about future and emerging technologies, which are not yet here, but we can foresee them because you can see what's, what's going on in laboratories. So in a, in a few years, all the sensors or the artificial uh, entities and intelligence will be absolutely here. So um, I know what, um, what those people think, uh, uh, the, the future IT professionals, because I, I'm teaching them at the other side of the Danube, at the University of Technology, where I'm also teaching. So I know how they think, and that's the reason why I'm teaching them, because they need someone to distract their attention from the code to, to something else. Maybe you uh, have heard about this. This is a very old style slide. It's from 96, although the slide is maybe from, uh, from uh, 97. Bioscript was a small Canadian company who invented something. Uh, I mean, no, the company was at that time called MyTech. And what they invented was called Bioscript. They pat patented this name and was originally uh, developed for protecting Alice and Bob, the, uh, the people who are communicating with each other through the internet from the external uh, uh, unauthorized, uh, unauthorized uh, uh, parties. And it was so successful in the, in the uh, 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 scientific uh, terms 
that they took the name of Bioscript, their, their product, as the company name. But uh, after a while, Bioscript Incorporated became something very, very different. It is the company which uh, designed and which distributed the one billion, more than one billion digital identities in India. And they proudly announced it just last year, uh, one month after the uh, enacting of the Aadhaar Act. So, um, and now it's a division, Bioscript uh, Incorporated is a division of a large defense contractor. So it's, uh, it's not anymore uh, a kind of uh, nice private uh, scientific company. So um, I think you will, uh, you will talk about uh, function creep. This is a bit more than a function creep. It's absolutely the other, other function. Some notions which are always mixed up. Although we are talking about persons, individual persons who have data. And these data are personal data. But in many countries and in many cultures, personal data means something intimate or, or sensitive. No, it's a formal category. Why I'm recommending you to follow the European approach, which could be strange, why India would follow a European approach instead of developing a, an own approach, for certain reasons, um, Colin Bennett, a Canadian scholar, already in the 80s uh, predicted that uh, technological convergence would lead to policy convergence. And that's the European approach in regarding personal data in general uh, provides a higher protection than the US or the Chinese or, whatever, or whichever uh, you can, you can uh, think of. So it's very easy. If there's a piece of data and, and you can relate the data to someone, that's personal data. Even the officials, when they are doing official business in, in their offices, they produce personal data. But it does not mean that personal data are secret. But formally, it's personal data. And if you manage to cut the relationship between the data and the person, then, then that would be the, the good solution what the, what the other system does not do in, in India. It's not about secrecy, as we all know, but about autonomy or self-determination. So sometimes these notions are mixed. Big data, I don't see any um, threat in big data in case if it does not target individuals. But in the case of India, it's just the opposite. It's targeting individuals. Big data, of course, uh, you can use it for different purposes. If you are able to singli single out uh, persons or linking records to individuals, identifiable individuals, or you can even predict their behavior, that's absolutely targeted use. Surveillance and democracy, uh, similarly as, as, um, as Aruna uh, thought, um, whether, whether capitalism and democracy is, is a friend or foe, or, or, or there's a, a sensible coexistence, I think, yes, surveillance and democracy can coexist, and we are not talking about, I'm sure there are some cameras in this room, but we are talking about data valence. That's, uh, that's a th the, uh, the, the core uh, subject of, of this uh, workshop. Surveillance and democracy. For example, if you don't uh, know this book, it's, it's quite interesting. And also, maybe here, about the social and the economic costs of surveillance, I, I can't leave it here, but if you are interested, you can, you can uh, take a look at this. The literature is very wide, but I would like to, to, uh, to, to show you my two last slides because I'm running out of time. If, um, if you allow me to offer some suggestions, let's, let's say, from a former new democracy, the first and foremost is don't wait until the public, the everyday people, really understands the informational information rights, the technology and their implications. When they will realize, and, and only a, a fraction of, of them will realize, it's, it will be too late. So if you can, please establish institutions as soon as possible. Institutions in any sense in uh, legal institutions, formal institutions. Of course, uh, we, we are not uh, 
uh, we, we are not in a position to, to establish institutions, but if you can have an impact on it, that's very important. All those in institutions, including the, the uh, privacy protection and, uh, and the supervision of, of privacy protection and freedom of information, maybe it's still, it's eroding, but still the, the strongest constitutional right in Hungary and <coughs> because, uh, I must say we, because I, I was involved in this process, we managed to establish the institutions very, very early when most of the people didn't, didn't understand what it was. So the two sister, inf <coughs> sister rights, the access to information and informational privacy should not play against each other. IT professionals are, are crucial. And if you can convince them that it's not the code and the money is everything that counts, then it's something, uh, something better. Economies are also important. Corporate social responsibilities is, is something uh, really, really very far from, uh, from those people who introduced these systems. But, uh, but it fits into the, into the corporate logic. So that, that's also maybe there, there's some niche for this. NGOs can act as intermediaries like MKSs. If you use simple language like MKSs, again, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's much better than, than the usual statistics and all kinds of uh, technical language nobody understands. And uh, finally, recognize if something improves. It's, uh, it's tricky because if, uh, if NGOs or, or, or the civil society is fighting against a bad system, it's very difficult to say, yes, it's better. Now, it's not perfect, <coughs> but it improved. Of course, uh, it's very difficult to find the, the, the right balance between, uh, between uh, confrontative and cooperative manner, but you should recognize it's something it through, and that's my last side. Some technical suggestion. Now at this level in India, it's very difficult to suggest something like instead of centralized targeted distribution, you could recommend group level distribution. It's much better than the centralized one. We, we all know that. There are some techniques, well-known techniques, like the anonymization uh, techniques or technologies, the well-known Article 19 working group, or the GDPR, that's the new general data protection uh, regulation which will en enter into force next year in Europe. There are some good criteria. There are some very simple and really widespread technical solutions like, it, it might sound strange, unidirectional data transformation methods, hash algorithms, for those who, who know what it is. But at the legal uh, level, it's technical still. Strict purpose specification would help a little bit. It will not solve all the problems. Data minimization, uh, minimization might sound really strange in today's world when, when we are talking about big data and, and the bigger, the more, uh, the better. Um, data minimization is an existing principle, but only for individuals, for targeted, identifiable individuals, not the statistical data. Transparency and access rights, that's, uh, we already talked about this, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me today, and thank you very much for your speeches. It was very interesting for me to find out about what's happening in India. Uh, a bit of context about um, where I come from and a bit of my background, because I think it's important. Um, I'm a researcher in um, international business law here at CU. I basically research the phenomenon of propertization of data. So I'm studying big data as well as data protection. So I'm very much aware of this, what's mentioned here on this very technical slide. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, I'm also working for an advisory company um, which works with uh, tech companies and telecommunication companies. So basically, I study the intersection between law, regulation, and technology. So I sort of come a bit from the business side as well, which gives me a very interesting perspective on both sides of, of the story, both the individual and the business and market perspective. Um, my main message for you today is not going to relate to data protection specifically. Or I'm not going to go into, into what uh, the law is saying, because I think you are more or, or more or less aware of it. And I think 
it's 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 useless to go into specific legal boring details i'm going to try to give a pers uh, more general overview or perspective of what's happening and the reason for that is is that i believe we're living in some very exciting times because we are at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution as we all know uh, this opens a lot of opportunities for everyone, for all stakeholders, both governments and the market, as well as NGOs, civil society and individuals, because many of the things that have been settled so far, rights, obligations, roles in the society are challenged and we have to rediscuss them. And uh, many of the debates are redebated and reopened and there's many uncertain things. Uh, and this is why it's also very challenging, not only interesting and exciting, but also very challenging, because many of the things that we knew to be settled are, again, once again, open for discussion, and uh, it's up to us to, to, to debate on those. Um, but the message is that we need to get ready for what's next, because what's next is inevitable. And actually, my, the title of today's presentation was Big Data in the ha Hands of Government. Uh, is it a win-win situation, as those that are fighting for data uh, uses and for technology say? Or is it an in inescapable trap? Is it something that no matter what we're doing, we cannot escape? And looking at how the market looks like, looking at what's happening at the moment out there in the society, it's very hard to deny that this is something that can be, uh, to deny uh, this is a phenomenon. And it's very, very hard to fight against it. So what we can do, as I'm going to, to um, address in the second part of my little speech, is I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to advocate uh, for the need to get ready for it and what we can do us uh, as a society, us as uh, the market, us as advisors for those that actually have a say on what's happening at governmental and regulators level, those that make decisions. Um, so a couple of points before that. Um, as we all know, the proportions of, of, of tech changes are un unprecedented, probably. We have, uh, as we all, we, you all said, there's a massive digitalization taking place all over the sectors in society. We are facing automation. We have uh, future threats that are, are, um, are challenging, like the Internet of Things that is right across the corner and that's already out there in some fields. Uh, we have the threat of artificial intelligence. That's why there's many debates at, uh, at even at EU level in many countries about how to do with this threat of artificial intelligence that's going to come for sure uh, in a couple of years. Um, and big data, which is basically the result or th what's collected, what's used by all these types of technologies, is just one of them. So it's just one of the things that we need to tackle. Uh, from the legal and from the regulation side, um, whose role in general is, is to make sure that the interests of all those that are affected are well balanced and that there are no abuses that are committed um, by those that own the data, by those that have a say on what data is used for. Um, the problem is that law and regulation are kind of slow. They are not proactive. They don't, for, for, the, reason, for, the, way, for the reason that law and regulation work uh, as a result of the democratic process, they are slow and they fail to anticipate the direction which technology is going. So this is something that we have to acknowledge and we have to accept both as, as legal professionals as well as members of civil society. So all those involved uh, in, the, in this process. Um, Moreover, it's important to acknowledge that technology is driven by the market. It's driven by companies and by research centers that are actively pumping money into researching to develop this type of technologies, whether we want it or not. A universal ban on this type of research will never realistically take place. And that's why it's another, it's another point why I'm saying that technology is, uh, development is not something that we can stop. We can only work into directing it to where it should be or to minimize the risks that, that can occur from technology development. Um, and actually, the state, the government, is not an exception to these uh, changes in technology. Many states, many governments have started to embrace technological change by, uh, by, by implementing different technological tools into, into their, their ways in which they govern and um, I'm just, you just mentioned e, 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 uh, electronic voting, so e-voting e in general, which is, has been already used in some countries successfully, in some others not that successfully, but again, it's all a matter of how exactly we make sure that they are, are, are uh, well implemented. 
Um, and I'm just going to give a couple of examples into how data and technologies are, be, are be, being used in societies already and what are some of the problems that might occur. Um, for instance, there's already a whole industry out there that targets governments and ways to digitize governance tools. Uh, besides this e-voting and electronic data databases, there's also um, a, a large industry that is, is built upon digitization of filing of legal documents to courts and transforming the entire legal system into, into electronic uh, and to, into digital, different digital um, trials, digital judges. Th this is already out there and is being tested in some countries more than in others. For instance, the US is already testing this. Um, and there's no ways or there's no tools in place to make sure that the risks that stand, stand next to this, uh, these changes uh, will not, will not uh, be concretized. Also, a very big problem, the healthcare industry. We are assisting at the digitization of the healthcare system. Um, right now, and actually this is very important for the healthcare industry, is that all hospitals, all insurance companies, they have a database of patients' medical data. With this digitization, everything becomes um, is much easier to interpret, is much easier to, to, to store, to use, to read. And a very big problem um, is that over the last decade, uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, have been aggregating years of research and development data into medical databases, while payers and providers have digitized their patient records. The questions that arise from here is, A, who owns this data? B, how many, how much control do we have as patients over that data? And uh, C, can we in any way control what happens with this data, which is very personal, sensitive data that we as patients, all of us members and uh, users of the healthcare system are, uh, are, are using. So these are questions that are, n are and not that much answer to. And these are some of the challenges that, that the governments have to face by enacting legislation and by enacting rules that protect our sensitive data um, at this level as well, so in the healthcare industry. And there's many interests at stake. You can imagine how, how much lobby is put by pharmaceutical companies and by insurance companies into making sure that the answer to who owns this data and how much leverage we have is them, of course, not as the patients. So you can imagine how, um, what a big challenge this is for the government. Then we also assist to the emergence of smart cities. And actually, I wanted to give you an example here because it's a very interesting project that's happening at EU level right now. It's called Orga Organic City, which is a new EU project which has chosen three cities, London, Santander, and Aarhus, um, to test the concept of smart city in the upcoming years. And for, the, for those of you that don't know what a uh, smart city is, uh, it's an urban development vision which seeks to integrate IT solutions um, and Internet of Things technology uh, with the infrastructure in order to try to make, to, improve, to make improvements to the lives of citizens and maximize efficiency and uh, loss of resources. So sort of to m have a better use of resources in general. And uh, just to give you a couple of examples, a coordination of traffic lights with uh, the public transportation system, the lighting system, uh, the sewage system. Imagine all of them being connected, all of them being, uh, all the data being monitored, stored, interpreted, used by the local municipality in order to make sure that um, resources are, are used in an in a, in efficient manner. So these three cities are currently um, testing these technologies. And again, it's not very clear what's happening with the data that's stored and that's collected uh, under a smart city type of vision. We are going to see. Um, use of big data and surveillance is something that we've already talked about. And uh, here we're not talking only about the, the secret services like the huge NSA scandal a couple of years ago, but about um, very visible collection of data by government authorities and here we can already see CCTV surveillance, which is present in more or less all, all large cities in the world. Um, collection and recording of data for security reasons, uh, digitization of documents and records. And by the way, Australia just announced that they will replace um, passports with facial recognition technologies by 2020. So it's the first country to have done so. So this is one of another example of countries moving forward into adopting, embracing this type of technologies. Um, without having yet any, any idea as to how 
this will impact the data and our individual rights. And of course, this type of, this type of technology raises questions as to privacy, uh, the privacy of individual users, the, the decisional autonomy of individual users. Um, and even more interestingly, this completely redrafts the role uh, of government as citizens into, into this, into how we, we, we think of, of democracy in general, because this type of use uh, of big data and surveillance is something that governments directly are doing, not companies, not the market, but the governments themselves. And with the governments, in theory, having the role of um, the ones that protect us, are supposed to protect us and safeguard uh, our rights and make sure that uh, no abuses are committed, the fact that they will have so much power into their hands and so much insights, legitimized but by their role in a democracy, um, is something that we should all think about. And I'm not going to go into this because you've already raised lots of interesting questions about this, but uh, it's a really interesting uh, point. And last but not least, again about the government, the use of big data in crime prevention, something that may, many, maybe some of you have seen the, um, the, the movie Minority Report. It's not like that. It's not a, s a science fiction technology that you have a device and just tells you what's going to happen. This is, a, this is an application based on big data analytics um, that has been tested by the LAPD, so Los Angeles Police Department. And I'm just going to explain you how it works because it's relevant for some of the pro social problems that might come out of this use. What they have been doing using a software uh, based on data is they basically fed this program 13 million arrests from the last eight, 80 years. Based on this data, they got predictions that match with uh, what had happened in the past. So that basically, um, that's how they tested it. They wanted to see whether the software worked and it proved that it works. So based on this test, they started uh, using it on a large scale in the United States, but by all police departments. The project, it's called, or the program is called uh, PredPol. Um, and the question is, does it work? Can you really accurately predict crimes in some sectors um, in, in your city? And I'm, not, I'm gonna let you judge. The numbers say that there's been a 12% decrease in property crimes and a 26% 26% increase, sorry, decrease in a burglary in those given uh, precincts in which they said that um, that less crimes will become, that there's a high occurrence of crimes. Um, it may work if you look at statistics, but uh, of course, another big problem comes into play, which is the fact that um, studies show that police data tends to be racially biased, and we might, we, we are all aware of the phenomenon of uh, racial profiling, and this is just something that has the very same problems, because it's all a matter of what type of data you're, you're feeding the program, and uh, whether it's data that is based on the actual number of arrests, or data of, convic uh, of convic convictions, um, or even if it's the number of convictions, um, the data is highly influenced by the racial and social division of those societies, which again, it's a vicious circle that it's very hard to avoid. Um, and it's many accuse this technology that's again, widely used in the US and it's um, even in some small cities in Belgium, they try to implement it, that uh, it only feeds more into this um, racial bias and uh, racial discrimination. So to sort of conclude, we see the technologies here and it's happening all around us in different places of the world. It's something that we cannot escape and all these technologies are, are generating huge, large amounts of data. The question is not, is that something good or bad? The question is, are we ready for it? What can we do to, to get ready for it? And um, do we have the required infrastructure to make sure that we draw all the benefits from the use of, of, uh, of big data? Because there are some benefits. It does lead to some, um, some more efficient use of resources. It does lead to, some, to more access to information. But at the same time, there's this huge risk that we have to be ready for, that we, we as the ones that have influence on uh, decision makers and regulators, though they make the rules, um, have sort of the responsibility to make sure that they are tackled and, uh, um, and so on. Um, are there laws in place enough uh, to make sure that rights and interests are, are protected, that abuses are prevented, that the data is safe? And just think about security, cybersecurity threats. 
and leaks and the potential to have leaks to this, uh, to this type of data. Think about companies and governments that may resell the data sets. And we've seen Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook's example here. That's a good example. And especially in the US, which does not have such a strong privacy um, framework, legal framework, and that uh, is much more market oriented in the way in which they regulate uh, the rights over data. Um, how far should we go into balancing the rights of those that are that are um, involved in the market, that are involved in the in the whole process that collects, generates, stores, interprets, sells the data? Do we have effective means of enforcement of the laws and the rules that, in order to make sure that okay, we have laws, we might have the general data protection regulation, we might have um, um, different laws in different countries, but do we actually, are we actually um, able to enforce them? Is the population aware of, of these rules? Um, what is the general perception of the society about it? And last but not least, what should these rules be? Because there's a huge division across the globe uh, as to what interests should prevail and how we should regulate it. We might think here uh, on our side of the, of the world that Yes, the individual should prevail. We have to be make sure not to transform our society to an, into a hundred percent Aurelian society, and you know, use I think the word uh, very creepy society. But at the, on the other side of the wall, there's a huge number of, of um, corporations and businesses, and actually market actors and individuals that might fight for their own interests. And it's very hard for the government, and maybe I'm here a bit neutral in this perspective, to try to balance this this duality of interests and that we should be i think it's important to be aware of all these aspects and i think it's important to hear all parts out before making any decisions and to try to as as a society to try to to tackle all the risks in a manner that does not favor one side or another ideally but that's again very hard to do uh, but on the contrary that is tries to um to balance out all this interest and yes Big data will end up in the hands of the government. It will end up in the hands of, uh, of cor big evil corporations. The question is what happens after? What happens when they do have it? And how can we make sure that it won't affect us as a society, as individuals, as at market actors? Um, thank you very much for your attention. This is what I wanted to cover in the six minutes I had. I wanted to, to kind of bring in the role of companies and their obligations to, to respecting uh, users' privacy, and um, to review some of the findings that we um, discovered with our most recent um, corporate accountability index, which I'll explain, which is this on the screen. Um, and then hopefully, I guess, once I finish, we can have time to discuss maybe during the discussion time. So just really quickly, Ranking Digital Rights is a project based out of Washington, D.C. I have a desk here at the Center for Media Data Society at the School of Public Policy. Um, and RDR produces an, an annual corporate accountabil accountability index that ranks how some of the world's um, largest tech companies disclose policies affecting uh, users' freedom of expression and privacy. Um, the project was created a few years ago by digital rights um, advocate Rebecca McKinnon. Some of you might know her work. Um, and it was really developed as kind of um, a standard setting and benchmarking tool that, that kind of tries to encourage companies to abide by international human rights principles and norms. Um, so in 2015, RDR released its first index, which ranked 26 or 16 companies. And then just this March, we released our second index, which ranked uh, the same 16 companies plus an additional six. Um, so I want to look at a few of the findings and some data points from the 2017 index and specifically regarding what we found to be um, a significant lack of transparency among companies about what user information they collect, share, and with whom. Um, our data also shows that these companies are falling drastically short of protecting users' rights, particularly in the face of growing demands from governments around the world to hand over user information. Um, so these are the, the companies that we ranked this year. Um, they're divided into internet and mobile companies and then telecommunications companies. We did rank Bharti, Airtel, and in, in India. Um, just really quickly uh, about the index. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
the index is really a transparency project, so we measure company disclosure of their policies. We don't actually measure practices so much. We encourage inf other, other researchers to, to take on that element of it, but what we do is mostly focus on disclosure of their policies. And we take this position because we believe and others believe that transparency is the critical kind of first step to holding companies accountable. And users also need to have this information in order to make um, informed decisions about um, the potential risks of using different company services. Um, so the, the standards that the index uses um, to measure companies are drawn uh, from, from the body of international human rights instruments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also from the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Uh, which, for those who are not familiar, it, the UN Guiding Principles were developed by um, John Ruggie of Harvard when he served at the, as the UN Special Representative for Business and Human Rights. Um, he stewarded the development of this set of principles, uh, basically which say that just as um, states are obliged to protect human rights, so too are companies. So more and more companies have been signing on to, to, the, to upholding the UNGP, more should, um, but it definitely is a, is a growing trend. Um, so the index methodology was developed over a few years of consultation with civil society, policymakers, and companies. And just really quickly, we, we measure companies with 35 indicators across three different categories. Um, governance measures if and how a company publicly commits to ad adhering to international freedom of expression and privacy standards. Um, the freedom of expression category measures company disclosure of policies affecting users' freedom of expression. So in this category, we look at things like um, the availability and understandability of terms of service agreements, um, the clarity of rules, uh, what is permitted, how the rules are enforced, how transparent companies are in handling requests from governments and third parties to remove content, um, and things like identity policies, whether, uh, the company, whether companies disclose if they require users to verify their identities with a government-issued ID. In the privacy category, which we'll look at more today, um, there's 18 indicator, indicators, it's our biggest category, um, addressing if and how clearly companies disclose policies related to users' privacy. Um, oh, sorry, I should change. This is our privacy category. Um, so we have a group of seven indicators on the company disclosure of policies about how they handle user information, which we'll look at more in detail. We also have a group of indicators um, that measure company disclosure of how they respond to government or third party requests for user information. We also have a, a bigger set of indicators on security. Um, so just, this is how the companies, this is the ranking for 2017. Um, Google is the top ranked company, which comes as a, as a surprise to many privacy rights folks. And the reason why Google does so well in this ranking is because we measure disclosure and Google does a really good job of explaining its policies no matter if Let them it's read it or not. <laughs> what? Let them read it or not. Read well, it. yeah, exactly. I mean, their policy environment is quite robust So, in, in comparison to the other 22 that we looked at. So, and no, we don't take funding from Google, which is something we got asked when we <laughs> released the index. Um, <laughs> um, but, and notably, actually, Apple scored much lower than, than one would expect. Um, Apple actually probably might do more to protect users' privacy, for instance, but it has a very thin uh, policy environment. It does not disclose a lot of its policies in its policy documents. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, and the telecommunications companies, AT&T and Vodafone, they tied for the top spot. Um, and interestingly, also, the Vodafone, Telefonica, and, and Orange, which are the EU with, with telecommunications companies uh, in the EU, they actually had uh, kind of a mixed bag of, of disclosure. And that was kind of surprising for us, given the EU policy environment is more kind of progressive in terms of data protection. Um, OK. So I, but um, at, beyond this, I kind of want to look at two um, data points and findings within the privacy category. So one of our bigger findings um, this year was that companies lack disclosure of how they handle 
user information. So, and we have a whole chapter on it in the report, chapter six. Um, but I, I kind of want to unpack this because I think it relates to some of what we've been talking about today. Um, so first I want to look at the set of indicators related to um, how companies disclose how they handle user information, P3 through P9, and then transparency of how companies respond to and comply with third-party requests for user information. So the first set of indicators, um, I'm not going to go through them, but you, got, you can you know, read what they are. It's it basically, um, we have seven indicators that cover um, if and how clearly companies disclose what types of user information they collect, um, share, uh, the purpose for collecting and sharing, and for how long they uh, retain it. And then these indicators um, also look at, um, f they also ask us companies to offer users options to control what information is collected and to disclose options to obtain all of the information that a company holds about them. And then P9 measures, it's just for internet companies, it measures how if companies disclose if and how they collect user information using things like third party trackers and cookies. Um, so, and this is the, some of the, one of the findings of, uh, from this set of indicators. Um, basically across the board, we found that companies failed to meet, uh, failed to disclose enough about how they handle user information. Um, while some companies disclosed more than others, none disclosed enough detail about their policies for users to be able to fully understand the privacy implications and risks of joining a particular service. Um, in particular, um, we found the lowest level of disclosure about f um, for P6, which, is, which measures um, disclosure of how long companies retain user information. And we also found a really low level of disclosure of um, P7, which is um, disclosure by companies of what options users have to control the information that's collected about them. Um, and this is how the, uh, it broke out with those indicators by, by company. Um, internet and mobile companies, on average, uh, disclose more than telcos, um, although disclosure among internet and mobile companies was still quite low. Um, Twitter actually had the highest score. Um, its privacy policy is one of the, interestingly, one of the more clear examples of how a company explains how it handles information for each type of user information it collects. It's quite, a, it's an example of a good privacy policy, although they don't disclose everything. Um, Facebook, interestingly, just received the lowest score um, for P7, which measures um, disclosure of how giving users options to control how, how companies collect and share their information. Um, and telecommunications, on average, scored or disclosed much less uh, than, than internet and mobile. AT&T was the only company to actually disclose any information about how long it retains um, information about users. Uh, let's see. Next. Um, so next, I kind of want to jump to the indicators around that measured how transparent companies are um, in responding to government, how they respond to government requests for user information. Um, the index has three indicators which address these issues. Uh, P10, which looks more about uh, the process, how companies explain their process, including we look for companies to push back on overbroad government requests. Um, P11 is measures the actual data, so these would be the the transparency reports that Google and Facebook publish. So that what, that's what we measure in P11. And P12 looks at whether companies um, disclose to users when their data has been requested by governments or third parties. Um, so for these set of indicators, we found that there's a lack of transparency about how companies handle government and other types of third party requests for user information. Internet companies, once again, tended to, to disclose a bit more. And there's a particular lack of transparency regarding whether companies notify users when governments or other third parties request their information, especially among telcos. Uh, so this is how the data looks. Microsoft disclosed the most. Google was slightly ahead of Apple. Um, the Russian and Chinese companies uh, disclo disclosed practically <coughs> nothing at all. In that context, actually, the, I mean, in the Russian context, at least, the Russian authorities have direct real-time access to all user data. <laughs> so they don't have to request. There's going to be no request for government information. They don't have to ask companies. So there's no way for mail.ru mail or Yandex to actually produce that information. But 
at least they, they could at least um, inform users that that's the case, which they do not do. So they don't inform users that they actually are being tracked in real time. Um, and then Kakao and Samsung is interesting, actually, because they both operate in the same market, but they have very different policies in terms of how they disclose, um, how they deal with government requests for information. So it's Samsung, for instance, could do much more. Um, and then one, yeah, this is the telcos, same. The telcos disclo disclose, obviously, much, much less. And again, the European telcos lack of disclosure um, on these indicators, most of them to us, argue that they don't disclose this because they're not allowed to, but they all, again, don't disclose what law prevents them from, from <coughs> disclosing this to the public. So Orange was particularly in, insistent about this with us. And then finally, P12. Um, this indicator looks at whether or not companies disclose if, it no if they notify users of when a government or third party makes a request for their information. Um, the, the scores for telecommunication companies is, are quite stark, so none of the, none of the telcos that we surveyed um, have a policy in place of notifying users if a government or a third party requests their, a user information. But some U.S. companies do. Um, anyway, that's, so what does this mean? Um, Overall, companies disclose little uh, about what uh, little information about u what user information they collect, share, and retain, and do not sufficiently disclose options allowing users to control their own information. And at the same time, companies overall are not transparent about what user information they share with governments or other third parties. 